All right, well, let's get started. It is my honor and pleasure tonight to kick off the evening and introduce our special guests tonight. My name is Christy Evans and I have the pleasure of working for Banffy here in the great state of Texas. And at first I wanna introduce Mino DiMartino. Mino has been with HEB for nine years and currently serves as HEB's corporate beer and wine club manager. Prior to HEB, Mino worked 20 plus years in the food and beverage industry and in prominent restaurants and country clubs throughout the United States. Mino is a native Italian born and raised in the beautiful town of Sorrento and also spent much of his childhood in Siena. So we want to welcome Mino from HEV. And next we have Joelle Cousins. Joelle is an account executive for Republic National Distributing Company, which is Banffy's great distributor partner in Texas and a critical piece to getting our wines into the shelves of HEV. Joelle is a certified sommelier, a certified specialist of wine with 15 years of experience in the food and wine industry. And we welcome Joelle to the night. Thank you, Joelle, for being here. And last, but definitely not least, it is my pleasure to introduce Christina Mariani May. Christina is the third generation family proprietor, sole CEO and founder of Banffy Wines. She's a champion for luxury wine and hospitality. Um, she's brave, motivating, strategic, empowering, and uh, I'm just so thankful uh, to be on the team with her. She was recently selected as Luxury Daily's Women to Watch in 2021. She's been recognized as one of Fortune's most innovative women, and recently Drinks Business International named her Woman of the Year. Not to mention mom of three, avid runner, and you'll see tonight, so down to earth and charming. We welcome Christina Mariani May. Oh, thanks, Christy. I need to get my husband to listen to that speech <laughs> more often. <laughs> but I just want to thank everybody from HEB for allowing our team from Bampi and RNDC and especially Mino for us to be here tonight because it has been one heck of a week in the United States and around the world. And I can only say that I am so grateful to Mino and HEB and the entire team with Dan and David and Karen to get away from the television tonight, have a glass of wine, don't do any dishes, leave the kids at home and or in the other room, I should say, and just really escape to Tuscany and a vacation. And we can't get there now, but the way, well, Mino, you're there now, which is quite great timing. But um, yeah. we really want to bring you here tonight through our friendship with the family at HEV. So we want to thank you. Thank you, Mino, for this opportunity. Christina, thank you very much to you and your team to doing this, to, to give us this huge opportunity. I want to say, uh, unfortunately, tonight, David couldn't make this evening through his uh, conflict or schedule conflict. So he's been very busy. We opened up a few more floors. So again, a huge uh, thank you to you and your team for a great job that you do and your support and our partnership with HB. And we thank you for everything again. Oh, well, Mino, we love your setting and we love your accent. So we're going to talk about how we can get an accent as beautiful as yours. So yeah. tonight, so Mino, we're, as you know, tonight um, or this evening for just a little bit, we want to bring you to Tuscany. So I was very fortunate that about four or three years ago, with David Duran of HEB, we filmed this beautiful commercial together in Montalcino, which is the home to my family's winery in Southern Tuscany. So rather than talk about it, we wanna show you our wonderful, beautiful family together in Tuscany. So we're gonna cue up the video. In Italia, great wine is called Vino Buono. And that's our goal in Montalcino, where my family created Banfi wines. Italians have been growing grapes here for a thousand years. The unique climates helped them create beautiful wines. And HEB has a great selection of Italian wines at great prices. So enjoy a little bit of Italy. Where wine is all about food, family, and friends. Chin chin. This is the Vino Buono department at HEB. No store does more than my HEB. Beautiful. 
Yes, and we saw David as well. So that's uh, my good friend and colleague, um, David Duran. So he was uh, tonight after all and in spirit. Um, but I just want to take some time really to explain how I ended up with an American accent in a winery owner in Tuscany, because it, it would appear that me know you should be the owner tonight and I should be the one questioning you um, coming from Texas. <laughs> My apology, I was uh, frozen a little bit, so I had uh, some uh, technical issue with uh, my connection, it was unstable, so I missed the last uh, couple minutes, so my apology to interrupt you, so again, thank you. No, no, it's all, all good, so we are on course, so I just want to take a few minutes to tell all of our guests, our guests. a little bit about Casello Banfi and the beautiful video you saw with um, HEB. So as you can tell, um, I am not born and raised in Italy, but um, my heart and soul is Italian. Um, so I was actually born in New York and my family started as wine merchants over 101 years ago. So it was 1919 that my grandfather came from Italy from the town of Sorono, which is up north by Milano. And he came from Italy to America when he was about 20 years old and started a company, but I have to tell you where the name Banfi came from. So when my grandfather was a little boy, he was very poor family who was actually Italian Americans. They were living in Connecticut. They were carriage makers and they couldn't raise my grandfather properly, the parents. So they sent him back to Sorono outside of Milan to study with his aunt. And his aunt was named Teodelinda Banfi. And Teo Delinda raised my grandfather for his entire youth. And she was an amazing woman in the history of the Vatican and the Catholic Church. Because at the time, she was head of the household for the Archbishop of Milan, who then was elected in the early 1900s to become Pope Pius XI. So my aunt Banfi was the first woman who wasn't a nun to be honored to move into the Vatican City and as such, she ran the entire household for Pope Pius XI. So she was in charge of picking out his robe every day. And I'd always say, well, that's not a tough choice. Is it red or is it white? Um, she did it every day. And she taught my grandfather everything about great food, culture, hospitality, wine. And when my grandfather was then 20 years old, after living with Teo Delinda Bambi, he came to Greenwich Village, Little Italy, New York, and he started importing a house, or started a house that imported products from Italy, and he named it Bampi after the aunt whom he loved like a mom. So today, actually, in honor of women, Teo Delinda was the first woman who was not a nun to be buried within the Vatican City as well. So that's a great, great honor. Um, if you ever see a picture of her, which I don't have here, but you'll know why they allowed her to be the first woman to live with thousands of celibate men. She was not a good looking woman by any means. So I think for the Vatican, it was an easy choice, but she had a great palate. She loved hospitality and she was a great teacher. So here tonight, in honor of all of our people with good palates and to all of our teachers out there, um, we're going to raise a glass to Teo Delinda. Um, I live in New York now, so I've been here, uh, head of our importing business is still in New York, so I've unfortunately been here a little longer than I like. I wish I was in Montalcino, Tuscany, but I've been kept from going there for now. So in my heart and soul, I go back and forth because my father actually built the winery in Tuscany as an American, Italian-American, back in 1978. So it was really kind of a big feat because not many Americans were going over to Italy to create wine estates from scratch. A lot of Italians were coming to California and to America. If you think of the big names like Mandavi and Sebastiani, the Gallos, they were all doing the reverse. So um, it was quite pioneering. And in all honesty, they wrote about us that we were not the New Yorkers who came into a sleepy town in Southern Tuscany to create a wine estate, we were the Texans, they called us. And I love it. There's a famous book on Montalcino and it says it was the Marianis were Texans. And I love that analogy because we think big, right? And yeah. all Texans, you think big, you go big and you're darn proud of it and you're bold. And that's what 
My father was. So he ended up amassing some land in Tuscany, um, which you saw in the beautiful video. Today, it is 7,100 acres of an agricultural estate. So it is big. It's like it's like the size of Manhattan. Um, you know, you're probably used to it in Texas, maybe a little more going out to those ranches, but in the middle of Tuscany, just south of Siena and south of Florence, it's um, something very special. And it's really dedicated, not just to wine, but olives and food and culture and hospitality. And it's a sustainable agricultural estate where one third of it is planted to vineyards. So some of the wines tonight, Mino, that we're having are all from our estate in Tuscany, where we've done years of pioneering research and types of varietals and, and ways to vinify and types of soil, because we had this big, bold perspective that let's try it. If it hasn't been done here, why do we have to always do it the way generations of grandfathers passed on to their children again and again? Let's try to respect that but to also see how we can constantly improve and make the world dedicated to finer wines and constantly in this pursuit of excellence. So we come here with you today um, to share with you this plethora of beautiful Tuscan wine. So Mino, I'm gonna pass it over to you because um, you know, at some point I think it's fun to start tasting. I'm doing a lot of talking here and I know it's been a heck of a long week. So to be honest, talking, I'm ready let's to get to the good part. <laughs> To be honest, I'm already to put some wine. Again, like I said before, you, your team and you guys do an amazing job on the wine. We love everything you do. We love our partnership, most important, with you and your team. Uh, we're going to start, I believe we're going to start, like you said, we're going to start a sample some with the Pinot Grigio. So I will say, uh, just let us know your style of Pinot Grigio. I love this. My wife loves this. These are like an everyday and it's our uh, staple in our house. And uh, please... Uh, it's all you. Well, again, I, Pinot Grigio is perfect for, you know, evening, aperitif. We all love our Pinot Grigios. Yeah. But what I particularly love about this Le Rime, and when we grow it in Tuscany, is that because it's Tuscan, we're slight, you know, we're central Italy. So that is, you know, among, it's just north of Rome. It's very warm. It can be very dry. We're at higher elevation, about 900 feet above sea level, but there's really long sunny days under the Tuscan sun. And these grapes, 100% Pinot Grigio grape, um, which is actually a reddish grape, ironically, like a reddish grayish grape, gray. Everybody thinks it must be green, but it's not. But it grows so ripe and beautiful in the warm Tuscan sun. So Mino, as you know, you're Italian. Most Pinot Grigios from Italy come from up north, right? Friuli, yeah, Friuli, Venezia. Friuli, Tre Venezia, all up in there. And they're beautiful. They're very aromatic, more delicate, maybe higher acidity because of the cooler climate, right? But when you go yeah. down south, it gets a little more tropical fruit and, um, a little more richness perhaps to it. And that's what I love about our Le Rime. It's only 100%, one of the few 100% Pinot Grigios from Tuscany here in America, which makes it quite unique. Christina, no, I think you. this is so cool because it speaks to what you were saying before about how your family is such innovators and not wanting to just do the status quo and to have exactly what you just described, Pinot Grigio 100% from Tuscany is just beautiful. It's so peachy to me. Like it's got this beautiful ripe peach and pear note um, and, and wonderful with food too. I mean, this is extremely mm. versatile. I think a lemon butter sauce pasta with capers, something like that, but also, you know, um, even your antipasta dishes as well and cheeses and, and things like that. But um, I think the expression is really, really cool and it totally speaks to everything you described about your wonderful family history. Well, this is a, such a friendly one. You can pair really, like I said before, uh, my wife and I will love this one. We have an afternoon on, uh, on the weekend. It's such easy, you can pair with anything and it's a great value for uh, our customer, for every one of us. Right, I love it, slightly chilled. Okay, so 
I'm going to have a little fun here because now I'm getting hungry because we always say in Italy, wine has to be paired with food, right? Otherwise, it's like combat conditions. You're going into war and you're not fully armored. You can only do it with food. So I was lucky enough to get some HEB snacks. <laughs> the rest of you don't have this. <laughs> so Amazing. I would pair it with, this is the pita chips, but I would pair this with like a hummus and pita. It's like, I love to have this when I watch the evening news. You know, I come home from a long day of work. I have a glass of Pinot Grigio that's chilled. It's mandatory when you have children at home, especially. Um, and I love to have it with like sack snacking, salting food, salty. So I always get it like some type of salty snack around and the richness cuts through the saltiness, I think of the, um, the labor you made in the Pinot Grigio, but that perfect chill makes it really appealing. That's so nice, Christina. Right. And, and Joelle, as you were saying, uh, just a little bit of education about Pinot Grigio in Tuscany. 1978, when we built Castello Banfi, the name of the winery, Pinot Grigio had actually never officially been grown in Tuscany. So it was wow. not recognized as a Tuscan varietal. So when you grew the, the grape of the Pinot Grigio, which is Pinot Gris when you go up north of Italy or if you're in Oregon, um, it's Pinot Gris, but it's the same grape. So when it was grown in Tuscany, they had to call it a table wine. It was a vino da tavola because there was no official Italian designation for a Pinot Grigio from Tuscany. So at Banfi, because we wanted to just see what could be done, we had a lot of virgin soil that had never been planted to vines. We said, well, let's try some Pinot Grigio. And they said, well, you can, but you can't call it Pinot Grigio. And we said, well, let us try. And they said, the Italian wine law, the government, said, okay, try it. And if after three vintages, it has the characteristics of a Pinot Grigio, you may label it as such. So after two vintages, we showed wonderful proof with the Le Rime and another wine we have called San Angelo, which we make. But we proved that Pinot Grigio can actually have a beautiful home under the Tuscan sun. And so we were among the first and we still are. So um, it's kind of exciting. You don't know what you're gonna get and the climate is constantly changing, evolving. You know, it's never the same. That's, that's the interesting thing about agriculture. It's, it keeps you on your toes. <laughs> I love that you did this because this wine is absolutely beautiful and so enjoyable to start our tasting. Um, I do want to encourage everybody on the call to please enter questions into the, into the chat. Um, we can answer any and all questions. We have the expert here herself. So um, now's the time and, and don't be shy. So I did wanna, wanna make that note as we move into our next wine, which is the Centine, uh, the Centine Red Blend, Winemaker's Red. Um, Christina, I love this wine and it's very, uh, very Tuscan, very juicy, drinkable. Um, please tell us more. Well, first, if you look at the label, a lot of people, I don't know if it's showing backwards there, but um, a lot of people, mispronounce the name. So I love the way, Joelle, you say it, but I kind of have to ask the authentic Italian Mino yes. how to say this name. I call it Centine. Oh, That's with an yeah. accent, with an Italian accent, about Centine. Centine. <laughs> so see Centine. how he puts the emphasis on the ch. The C-A is a ch. And D. Yes. You know, we'd say Centine, a lot of people say. And then you go, no, in Italian, it's Centine. So we like to say Centine for every day, and it's a good way to remember it because Centine is a Tuscan IGT, so a, a wine of the region of Tuscany, and it's a blend of Cabernet Sauvignon, Sangiovese, and Merlot, three of my favorite grape varieties. And what I love about blending these wines together is that you get a beautiful, kind of, well, let me get with glass, but a nice roundness and softness to the wine and fruitiness, but at the same time, what you're going to see is a nice structure because it's still the Sangiovese of Tuscany, which is a very strong, energized red wine. And that's why I love this wine, Joel Amino, for kind of everyday, very versatile, again, 
you know, open it up and just to enjoy. And this is our winemaker selection. And the vintage is 2017, which actually rated 90 points by Wine Spectator. So for the price point, this constantly gets like a best buy, best value. It's hard to beat for, uh, for 90 points. Can you elaborate a little bit on the vintage on the 17? You know, I know we have uh, some uh, 13 and 15, some of the best vintage in Italy. What 17 looks like on your eye? The 17 was an outstanding. We rate a lot of our vintages on five stars. So we will say that it was a five out of five star. So we had, um, we had 2013 was very good. We had 2000. 15 was, was exceptional for us. And we will have that when we come to the Brunello di Montalcino at the end. And then we had 16 was very good and 17. So we've been very blessed with some consistently outstanding vintages. Um, the one thing we battle from an educational, you know, just to tell you is we battle the heat now. You know, that's the one thing, I mean, we don't need to go into what's happening on the West Coast with the fires and the heat. But that's the one thing that we find, we're getting good consistent vintages, but also vintages that will vary as far as quantities, because if it's very hot and dry, um, the quantities can be very much reduced. But at Banthi, we, we are a sustainable estate, so we have lots of lakes and natural reservoirs where we're able to provide some water in dire circumstances to our vines, and that really can make a difference in today's agricultural climate. Beautiful wine. It's got this really nice mint palette to it. That's, it just come, I think maybe the Merlot and the Cabernet, the blend just really complements that Sangiovese in such a nice way. Um, I think it's, it's stunning. Yeah, it kind of has this little bite at the end too, which I love because it's not meant to be flabby. Like it's not meant to be very heavy because it's still Tuscan. You know, right. some, if you get just a pure Cabernet or Merlot, they're really like fruit bombs and they're great. But remember, the Tuscans are really food wines. You know, this is a wine that as it sits open, it gets softer and softer and that goes into the meal, um, which is what I love because, you know, some of those wines are just made for a steak or some of them, you might say, I just want one glass of that California cab, but then I'm kind of like filled up, um, you know, and what I love about particularly Centine is that it's just so quaffable. You can just kind of drink it and and it goes, if you move into the meal, as we get into our food pairings now, one of the things that I love to have with the Chantenay, and it really is the tried and true, the one thing we always love is we have to have it with our pasta. I mean, you know, and why it's so versatile is I love my kitchen sink pasta. It's my go-to, which basically means if I have grilled meat from the night before, you, you know, toss it in. If you have some great pasta sauce, like from ATB ready to go, you doctor it up or you have it simple. I mean, with a little Parmigiano Reggiano on, you know, a good linguine marinara, there's nothing better. You're in Italy for a few moments, so. I love and the wine is stunning, especially 90 point wine potato for our consumer and that kind of price as well. It's cannot get any better value than that. Christina, where, can you tell us where the chen Centine, I'm gonna try to say, I can't do, I'm from Texas, y'all. I was born and raised here, so forgive me. Uh, but Centine, where does that name come from? Sure, so Centine um, was actually a farmhouse, if you can see on the property surrounding the 12th century castle. So as you can maybe also see in the photograph in one of the boxes, um, the 12th century castle, is just magnificent and it crowns the property of Castello Banfi. So it's originally called Poggio alla Mura. The hill is Poggio alla of Mura, the walls. So it was really a walled fortress. And I want to tell the story of Centine because here was a big agricultural estate and they have many, many farmhouses on the property because the people, as in the medieval ages would wanna live within the castle keep. You know, they'd wanna be surrounded by the castle for the protection. And plus it was like a sharecropper's um, mentality where they'd share their crops with the community and the, the noblemen. Um, and then, you know, in return, get the land to, to work. 
and keeping their family. So Chantine, because it's for every day, it's really the everyday farmhouse, but it's it sits underneath this magnificent fortress that I just need to tell a quick story with the Chantine and, and we'll kind of bring that into the next wine, which is the Chianti Classico Reserva, because again, we're staying very Tuscan. But what I, is a great story of the medieval castle of Banfi is that it was actually where my family here, you know, uh, how many hundreds of years later, you know, in the 21st century from 1200 to over 800 years later, is just the third owner of the castle. Um, it sat in a nobleman's family named Conte Placido for hundreds of years. And Conte Placido actually was awarded the castle um, for his bravery in the battles where Siena, Mino, coming from Siena, was fighting with Florence. And Siena and Florence were constantly um, embattled over territory. And Montalcino is a tiny little hillside village, which today is known for its wines, but in the medieval ages was just another um, center among the vast land. And they would fight over Montalcino. And Montalcino was the neutral territory. It was like the Switzerland of Italy. So it would go back between the province of Siena, back to Florence, Siena, Florence. And finally, Conte Placido won the battles. It fell into the hands of the Sienese of Siena. So Montalcino and the castle was given to Conte Placido to live in for generations. So um, the area of Montalcino where we are is now in the province of Siena, which is beautiful history. Because, um, you know, a lot of this land is protected, you know, you know, it's protected for generations so that it can't change. And that's really what makes Tuscany so magnificent, I think. Yeah. I've been transported <laughs> from mm -hmm. time to your beautiful story to meet us. <laughs> Boy, I'm talking a lot. I think the wine is making me more verbose. <laughs> <laughs> this is wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the story. I'm sorry, my connection is very unstable. At times I get uh, kicked out, but uh, I hope, uh, yeah, the wine is fabulous. And the Siena, for people that have never been in Siena, Siena is probably the most beautiful city in Italy. It's just gorgeous, Montalcino, it's just stunning. Just amazing. So much history there. Um, yeah. So cool to hear the history and how that ties in with the Benfi family and your estate properties. and. Um, just wow, so wonderful. Um, so I think we should move into the next wine. Um, the, the Chianti Classico Reserva, to me, this wine always comes out in the fall. I mean, I'll drink it all year round, but it just reminds me of fall. The aromatics, the spice notes and the red fruits. And it's just, it's very nostalgic for me. And that might just be because maybe I first drank Chianti in the fall. I don't know. But uh, when I opened it today, I was just like, oh, this is the perfect time of year for this wine. Um, please tell us more. Yeah, it, I think it is. Because as you said, like the spice and the um, dark kind of plum and cherry wood fruit, I think reminds me of like a brick oven, you know, a fireplace outside. Totally. Absolutely. A little bit of earthiness kind of comes through, like, right? A little bit of mushroomy earthiness, which reminds oh, yeah. us of fall and the foliage. It really does. Yeah, almost like a tomato leaf kind of earthiness um, to the wine. And yes, in Texas, we sit around the, the fire all year round. Um, you know, it's never really too cold to be outside. And so um, that is exactly where it takes me is just to a little nighttime fire, either before dinner or after dinner. Um, it doesn't matter with this wine. I think you can enjoy it with or without food, um, which is so delightful. It's true. And I think this wine gets better as it you know, kind of ages too, um, in the glass. What do you think, Mino? Can you? I love the wine. I like, this one is very balanced. I like the finish. I like the earthiness. So it's a, a mouthfeel is amazing. The long finish. Uh, when I want to be honest, I'm a big uh, chicken cacciatore fan or village scalopine with a little prosciutto on top. So this one we just play stunning. That's a, I'm a huge villa lover and I like to do my with the prosciutto, a chunk of butter on the, on the pans and these will just perfect to get you the little earthiness just 
when you say very round, good finish, great balance, I love this one. I love, besides, I love all of your wine. That's not the point. And when I just want to, I'm going to be honest, I'm a huge fan as well of Manchego cheese. So I like a Manchego cheese with a little of pig jam on top. And this is actually, it's my staple with great everyday stuff because I drink a lot of European, I'm, a, I'm a crazy at times, I drink a lot of European wine, I'm Italian, so I drink a lot of Italian wine. Man after my own heart. <laughs> <laughs> we need you to visit us here. Come into my home. But next, we have to have you for dinner. So oh, thank you. I was just seeing that many of, uh, several of the participants on tonight's call have actually been to Casello Banfi in Montalcino. So this is more of a reunion for those of us, um, those who have visited, which I'm so glad. And for those who haven't had the chance, please promise me you'll put it on your bucket list when this whole, ugh, for lack of a better word, crap ends. Um, <laughs> I could use some more words, but that's actually we have the last one. But when this all ends, I just hope people will come visit us because it's it's truly a magical place and it's so special and it's so peaceful. And and I always like to say that the wines, for some reason, people will say, Oh, I had your wine in Italy and it was so magnificent. And I came back and I bought it in the States and I still love it, but it, it tastes different. And I said, well, did you notice when you were having the wine, you know, and you were sitting out on the balcony of your Tuscan hotel and looking at the cypress trees and the rolling hills, did you look over at your significant other and think, oh my gosh, they're really hot. You know, I forgot after all these years together. And I was like, but then you come home and you're doing the dishes and the kids are screaming about the internet not working. And you look over at him and you're like, God damn it, why don't you take out the garbage, you know? <laughs> and you forget how good he looked when he was in Tuscany. So I like to say that's often the same way as the wine. <laughs> Salute. Salute. So something kind of fun um, when we tell stories too about, Joel, I don't know, but about the, um, the Gallo, ne uh, Gallo Nero. Gallo Nero which is um, something that appears on a seal of many, many wines from the Chianti Classico region. So the Chianti Classico region where this Reserva comes from, it's actually just south of, of Florence, north of Siena. There we go, thank you. And yeah. right there, so it's a black rooster. And that is the seal now and the emblem of the Chianti Classico group, consortium. So why, right? So Chianti, first a little bit about Chianti and then why the Gallo Nero, the black rooster. But Chianti is predominantly Sangiovese grape. So the same grape we had in Centine, except it has to be 85% Sangiovese. So there's a minimum amount and then it can be blended with some other grapes. Very often in ours, we have a little bit of Cabernet Sauvignon and a little bit of Canaiolo Nero, which is a nice dark, rich red grape. Um, in the olden days, I should say decades ago, they used to use white wines to blend with the Sangiovese grape. And it made a much, you can imagine, take a little of the Virime, add it with the Chianti Classico, and you don't get a beautiful, as beautiful a wine. When they started blending more of a rich grape like Cabernet, it started making wines with really an international appeal. And that's when Chianti's started growing around the world. But the history of the Classico region, which is a very kind of small region of Chianti in a greater region of um, Chianti. So the Classico is just one territorial part of it has the Gallo Nero because again, in the medieval ages, about in the 1200s, Siena and Florence were again in battle. And this time it was over the territory, not just of Montalcino, but go north of Montalcino, the territory of Chianti Classico. So when legend has it, how they would determine which province the Chianti Classico region would fall under, they had a knight from Florence and one from Siena rise at dawn at the first crow of the rooster or what is it, crow? Yeah, crow of the rooster, yeah. howl of the rooster. That works. <laughs> yeah, crow. 
they would leave their posts in their towns and they would ride as far as they could go. And as far, whoever made it farther, that's where the boundary of their territory would end. So you can imagine who got farther. And that was Florence, because Florence is now in the, pro holds the province of Chianti Classico. And how? Well, they had to pick their rooster, which would be their morning wake up call of when they could start their ride. So Siena had a white rooster. And the night before they fed it a lot of good food and gnocchi and pasta, and they celebrated this beautiful fluffy white rooster. And what did the white rooster do the night before, but fell into a sound sleep and he didn't wake up with dawn and he slept through his wake up call. So the Sienese rider had a late start. In Florence, they took the Gallo Nero, the black rooster. And instead of giving him a cushy night in a posh hotel, they didn't feed him, you know, gave him a noisy room to be in and sleep deprived him. So that rooster never quite slept. And before the dawn came, it started crowing. So the Florentines could leave bright and early and get a head start because their rooster crowed and they left before the crack of dawn and they got much farther into Chianti Classico. So today the Gallo Nero is celebrated for the Florentines who have the region of Chianti Classico. So we, I love the Italians with their stories. Mino, you have to say, there's nobody like it. No, we, we are the best on telling story and drinking right. wine. <laughs> that I, was I, the best. The more, I want to be honest to you. I relate the more to the white rooster than the black rooster because I'm the one that like to drink and sleep. <laughs> <laughs> that was the best explanation I've ever heard of the Gallo Nero. So this just goes to show you, you can only read so much in a textbook about wine and you learn, you know, you see this on the bottles of Chianti, but Christina, that was such a wonderful explanation. Thank you once again for that story. I mean, truly, I, I'm never going to forget that now. That is, <laughs> that is ingrained in my head. So Wonderful images there. Um, yes, and like Mino said, I'm probably more like the, the white rooster as well. So um, that's fabulous, wonderful. So, so as we're just, do you want to move on to the next wine or? I, I think Can so, I, I think we're excited. This is true in, uh, in, uh, in Florence and Siena, they always fight even in Siena. For people that never been in Siena, there is a famous race called Palio di Siena which have a 17 Contrada, they do North race. It's been there since the 1100. It's one of the craziest things I ever see in my life in the years of living there, where husband and wife, they fight all the time. If they are from different Contrada, they don't even talk to each other. It's a, one of the craziest things I ever think, and it's, uh, it's been there for a century. And that's after that, they all, after the race is over, uh, they do one in July 2nd. And uh, for uh, because it's a Santa Caterina, which is the patron of Siena, and the one in August, and they it's like one of the craziest things I've seen in life. We all have to get there. <laughs> but we're tired of Biden and Trump, to be honest. So. Uh, uh, no, no, no more fighting. Yes, exactly. <laughs> we don't want fighting in our household with different parties, right? We just want peace, <laughs> love, and wine. <laughs> yes. Christina, your family is is obviously the pioneers of this region, but Brunello specifically, right, which is our next wine. Um, so, you know, I know you mentioned the 2015 vintage was just five out of five. I couldn't agree more. Um, what, you know, tell us more about what what we need to know about Brunello and Banfi does with, with this beautiful wine. Well, this is, this is, there's a lot to talk about when it comes to Brunello. I'm going to keep it short and sweet. Um, but if you're into wine, this is a wine that you can study and research and has so many layers. So let me just go into the basics of what makes a Brunello. So Brunello di Montalcino is, has to be made within the district of Montalcino, which is quite small. It's, it's like the Chianti Classico. Um, and there, within that district, the wine has to be 100% Sangiovese. So where the Chianti can be 85%, Brunello has to be pure Sangiovese. And it has to be aged for four years of a minimum with two of those in wood at a minimum. So there's very strict guidelines on how the wines have to be made in order to qualify it as a um, Brunello di Montalcino. 
So I just want to go into a little bit about the territory and why Brunello is really known as the, one of the great red wines in Tuscany, in Italy, really today, or around the world. And what makes it special is that it is pure. And Sangiovese as a grape is a very finicky, difficult grape to grow and vinify in the sense that it is finicky. It quickly mutates to its soil. It quickly mutates to its microclimate and it can change very steadily in the bottle. That's also what makes it so special. Think of it like people often compare Sangiovese to Pinot Noir. If you like Pinot Noir, it's something so unique, but it is so different if it comes from Burgundy versus Oregon versus California versus Tuscany, a Pinot Noir tastes totally different. And the same thing with Sangiovese. So if you taste it from Chianti, it will taste different from Brunello's. If you taste it from different regions within Montalcino of just different subzones, it can taste very different as well. So at Castello Bampi, we're in the southern portion, corner of the district of Montalcino. So because we're south facing, we get a lot of sun, a lot of warmth, long growing days. So we get Sangiovese that can be quite ripe and full and rich, and but it still has this backbone of acidity, astringency, and energy. Shame on me, I still have the cork in it. Um, so what I love is when we first came to Montalcino, with Castello Bampi, there was about 10 producers of wine in the region. So it was 1978. Castel, a, a Brunello had been founded by um, Bianchi Santi, which is a very old historic producer. And he founded the wine Brunello from Sangiovese. But after he founded it, the, the town produced very little of it beside for Bianchi Santi. And it wasn't until a lot of work started to be done that you started to see more and more Brunello start to get produced. So today, Beyond Visanti is still one of the most beautiful historic wines of the region. But what's exciting about Montalcino today is that when we first got there, there was 10 producers. Today, there's over 260. And when you get that, you get a whole range of just wines that can be pioneering and an effort made. And we were one of the first, I'm proud to say, as Italian Americans to come in and really research and develop the Sangiovese for Brunellos as we know them today. So we took on a, a, a research project that was over 30 years it took us to find the best clones of Sangiovese to make a Brunello that was more luscious and ripe and ready to drink today that didn't have to be aged for many, many years. And we're very proud. One last thing I'll say about our own estate, but we actually founded at Casella Bampi, we founded 15 clones of Sangiovese and we actually registered those with the Italian government. So we're the only single producer in Italy to register our clonal work with the Italian government. So today there are 45 nationally registered clones of Sangiovese. 15 of those were founded by Banfi. And what we wanna say is we want everybody to share in this research, understand how Brunellos can be made. It's your choice as a vintner how to make it, but if you have the knowledge, you have the power. And if you have the knowledge and we share it, everybody can make a better wine in the territory and then the entire territory will rise up and everybody will rise with that tide. So we're very proud that today, Montalcino has gone through a renaissance. And to me, it is one of the most special wines from around the world is the Brunello. It's a gorgeous wine. Can you elaborate a little bit about the name of Brunello? What does Brunello mean? On, um, sure. For people don't understand the Brunello words. Yeah, because they associate the Brunello with Sangiovese. Why? And Brunello refers to the like the little dark one because it was the berries and the clusters of Sangiovese that grow in Brunello are very small and tight. So there's a lot of skin to pulp ratio on the grapes. So because of that, you also get a lot of dark color and you get a lot of tannic structure. And that's where they came from. So is the Brunello the, the, the little brown, dark grape from the town of Montalcino, but it's actually Sangiovese, so. Yes. 
Uh, and also That's the funny. longevity of this wine, the longevity. I mean, you can keep this Brunello. To, obviously, we are on the retail world that we want you drink a Brunello every day. Uh, along with the others, but the Longello is wine, they are just stunning. I mean, that's a 20, 30 years wine uh, or amazing, amazing wine. I, I love the structure of it too, um, you know, where it is so powerful and bold and ageable, but like you said, it is approachable and it, you can you can absolutely drink this wine now. Um, you know, and I know that the 2015 vintage was very, um, you know, what, Christina, was it warm? Um, was it, what, what was it that made it, it so comfortable? Very warm throughout the entire summer, which is becoming quite typical in Tuscany. But right before the end, it in September, it started cooling down. We got okay. just a little bit of rain to like make the vines not suffer, but not an overwhelming amount. So we got that ripeness during the summer and then it started cooling the grape, bringing the alcohol levels down and then the harvest. It was actually one of the best vintages we've ever had. And you can tell. I have to say this, I think the 2015 by far is one of the best Brunellos we've ever made. It is so ready now when normally Brunellos took a long time as Mino was saying. You can drink this now, but if you get a case at HEV and then have a bottle every six months, come back and taste again, you will see what great Italian wine really, how it really lives. And it tells its own story over time. And that's what makes Italian wines and beautiful red wines so very special. I love that. And, you know, Christina, we have had a couple of questions about the 2020 vintage. Is there, can you speak to that and how it's been going this year in Montalcino? Yes. So um, the 2020 vintage is a vintage um, that will always be remembered in many, many ways. <laughs> um, unfortunately, not for always the exceptional wine, but more for the conditions in which it was harvested. So 2020 throughout Italy was actually quite good. Um, I wouldn't call it exceptional, but I would call it very good. Um, Mother Nature has a way of working on us and the quantities were down about 20%, um, which is maybe not a bad thing during a global pandemic because there is a lot of wine out there, especially when you walk through your HEB shops, the selection you have is magnificent and the prices you offer me know. So, um, the 2020 was very, very good. It was warm. We did get some rain, but it stayed very warm throughout the rest of the season. Um, fortunately, at Castello Vampi and, and throughout Italy, we were able to get a bit of the harvest in, even though it was under pandemic conditions, you know, mass. So fortunately in vineyards, you could do a lot of social distancing. It's when you come down to the winery, it gets a little more challenging. So. Good job. Wonderful, thank you for that. And I'm going to definitely be enjoying this wine with a number of different cuisines. Mino, what would you pair Brunello with? What's traditional? Well, you know, like I said, we have a, a, a Fiorentina. In a, in a, that's a classic pairing for Brunello. Fiorentina is like a huge T-bone steak when you go in Italy. Minimal cut is around three pound, three pound and a half. Is you to share with the two, and it's a, it's a big one, it's an amazing one, it serves something amazing. So, yeah, Fiorentina is a classic dish that we pair, but along again, like Christina said, this one is stunning, especially. I mean, I love Brunello, so I'm a very partial on those stuff. So, yeah, but Fiorentina is why. a classic dish of peachy to people they've been in Tuscany before, the peachy alla Fiorentina, which is a Peachy with, uh, it's a kind of pasta, almost made a pasta with, uh, I know some people over here like a wild game, like a rabbit, because it's a little more and it's like a, uh, like Bolognese style, but made a rabbit. It's very elegant and it's just the issue because the peachy, there can be, the peachy pasta can be a little heavier. It's again, it's a normal made of pasta and it's just perfect, just perfect. Yeah, the pinchy mino, right? They make it by rolling yeah. it out by hand. So it's like yes, a spaghetti, a thick spaghetti, but they roll it out so it points at the end. It's very dense yeah. and it can really absorb the sauce. So I would love the Brunello if you're going to make a sauce with like a parpadale or fettuccine, like yeah. the thicker rigatoni, the heavier pastas, it can really absorb a lot of flavor. Yes. That's so nice. Thank you for painting that beautiful picture. We can certainly get into a T-bone steak in Texas. That's very uh, as well. So I think anybody can re relate to that, but the way that you described it is very, 
um, very romanticized. I, I love it. I can just picture also it. Also, is the country for porcini. Some of the best porcini, they come mm -hmm. from Tuscany over there. So anything porcini, like, you know, if they mignon with the top with the porcini mushroom, that's amazing. Yeah, that earthiness of the mushroom yeah. with, yeah. and just simple, you know, the good olive oil, the beautiful meat that you have in Texas and HEB, simply grilled. Little rosemary, you know, is very common in Tuscany when it grows, and you just brush the rosemary across it with some good coarse salt. Um, in Portugal, I'm hungry. That's what I know. In New York, it's an hour later. <laughs> I'm getting hungry. <laughs> well, I think we should move on to this next selection, which is our last selection. Um, that I am so excited that we included this and that you decided to include this wine, Christina. It is such a fun one, the Rosa Regale. Yep. <laughs> right, Joe Alamino, I'm opening mine. Yeah, I'm over right now. Yeah. Interesting week, so we're going to keep the town purple. <laughs> yeah. I jumped the gun. Mine's open and ready to go, but I love uh, how festive it is. Let's hear the, let's hear the pop, right? I so know. So wait, 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 so I don't poke my eye out. Well, he's pointing to me. <laughs> Lesson I learned early on, maybe in college with my, uh, sparkling wines, but um, I love this wine. It's a red sparkling wine and it's actually from Piedmont. Um, but life is short, so we have to drink sparklers every day. But when I pour this wine, and if you have it at home and you're pouring it, what I adore is that color and that foam and the spumante. I mean, that's not behind white. I'm holding it up, you know, versus the white, but you can see it. It's rose and it's, petals and fresh fruit and sweet and strawberries and raspberries and fragrant. And I just think this is one of the most spectacular, unique wines. And I love the bottle too, which is really pretty. <laughs> and this wine, Rosa Regale, comes from Piedmont. So this is the one wine tonight from my family's winery, which is up in Northwestern Italy. And it is made from a grape called Brachetto. And Brachetto is a red grape it has very good um, fruit sweetness to it. And we stop the fermentation short. So we get the bubbles, but we don't get, um, but we keep a lot of the natural sweetness in it from stopping the fermentation. But what I love about Rose Regali is while it starts sweet and almost finishes crisp and dry, like it has a good acidity. So it's not cloying. It's kind of just refreshing and light and it's low alcohol. It's only 7%. So we can have a few glasses of this uh, by the fire or by the holidays with our pies as an aperitif with pies, chocolates. I mean, for the holidays as a gift, honestly, there's nothing more fun because it's so unique and different. Like people love it. They're like, what? What is this red sparkling wine? And then they taste it and they're like, yum. It's really good. <laughs> There is only one problem this one. You can finish the bottle in a few minutes because yes. it's down very, <laughs> that's down very yeah, But it is lower in alcohol. So you're, yeah, you know, no, maybe it's... some calories from the sugar, but it's a holiday. So who's counting, right? We all look great. I appreciate I that how- I have a snack that I can have here. So somebody sent me the HEB um, sugar and sea salt almonds covered in dark chocolate. I am keeping these right here with me because I love almonds because of their chunk, you know, the Christmas, you can almost smell a little toasted almonds in the nose. But we say this wine goes with chocolate better than anything because that acidity cuts right through the richness of the chocolate and it balances with the sweetness. So anything chocolate related, Rosergali, just think of that and you're in heaven. Thank you. Such a difficult thing to pair with, I find. You know, like cheeses, we can find lots of wines to pair with cheeses. And this, I love this wine with cheeses, by the way, because like you said, it's really light um, and low alcohol. And so it's really great for that aperitif cheese platter. Um, but chocolate is so difficult to pair with sometimes for me. And so I think you're absolutely right. This wine is my chocolate wine. Um, so it's, yeah, the, the refreshingness of the effervescence um, and then the the beautiful floral, you know, uh, red fruit, strawberry kind of notes are just gorgeous with the chocolate. So I could not agree more. Um, right. <laughs> love that. Mm -hmm. 
And it's one of favorite of many of our customers. As you know, we sell so many of these. That's delicious little wine. It is delicious. And what I love if you have friends or family or, you know, we're not doing that a lot right now, but even just a, a toast with friends virtually, this is a wine that just is unique and people talk about it. It's like a conversation piece. Like, wow, I've never had anything like that. And that's what I love about it. It's it's different, you know, and it's it's easy. And like I even have here the two bite brownies and why they call them two bites. I guess there's two bites that you do at HEV in one brownie, but who has one brownie? I mean, come on, especially when you're a glass of rose or a golly. You're like, I don't have two bites, I have 20. Um, and that's the fun thing when you have the wine with the food. You just want to kind of keep going and experience it on your palate. Fantastic. Absolutely love it. So I think with that, I know we're kind of getting close maybe on time. Um, you know, if anybody has any questions or, you know, I have to also raise a toast to all of us Americans, how much I love every one of us and God bless us all. And, um, hope everybody stays safe and, you know, sane and to come visit us in Tuscany. We're waiting for you at Casello Banfi with our hotel. We have a beautiful hotel called Casello Banfi Il Borgo with 14 luxury suites. It's Relay and Chateau. It's magnificent. We have the restaurants to dine in, the balsamaria, the, the olive oil is made. So promise you'll come stay with us. Um, we love having our fellow Americans there experiencing some passion for Italy. So I hope you can come soon. In the meantime, we have to stay safe and sound. So <laughs> and I'll be there, Christina. Thank you for the invite. <laughs> thank you so much for, for helping us. We're not going anywhere. <laughs> Mino, Christina, thank on you. The behalf of, uh, Christina, on behalf of uh, David, Dan, Karen, uh, Mia, Dintaria, HEB uh, wine team, we would like to thank you again, you and your team, for a such a wonderful night. And uh, again, thank you as well for uh, Christina Evans. She's been amazing. Uh, she's awesome. And again, thank you to all your team for supporting us and our great partnership we have together. So thank you. Salute. 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 First of all, also thank you to all our attendees and our customer to attend this beautiful night. Uh, God bless you, and I hope you guys stay safe, everyone. Yes. Here, here. Salute. Salute. Ciao. Bye, everyone.